welcome to the Forest Creek Podcast and to episode 3, or part 3 of episode 14 of our conversation with Father Anthony Paul, Father AP. If you haven't already and you like to do things in order, go ahead and check out parts 1 and 2. Someone was asking me, which of the parts do I think is the best? The first part, probably more philosophical. The second part, a little bit more intellectual. This part, probably a little bit more topical. Father AP has already left us. And I don't mean the Earth, I just mean Vancouver. No idea where he's off to next, but we wish him the best. God bless. We do hope to have him again in the future. But in the meantime, I hope this will be enough. So, I know you came on here because you thought we were going to talk about cancel culture. (laughs) And we're getting close. Is Christianity aligned with conservative or liberal values? Is the same true politically? Do you find yourself in alignment with one or the other, or one side of it? And do you find that you're fellow clergymen tend to agree on these points. I know you mentioned something earlier on where you were saying that there's actually a lot of room for progressivism. Yeah, that's Orthodox. loaded. I think I'd rather start backwards. You're saying because the state is not a function of church, no party is really going to ever be like yeah. the right party. There's no party of Christ. Right? So like I like like even in the debates because I've spent a long time in America, right? So like on the American side of Oh, but they're pro, insert whatever the church is not pro, right? Where I'm just like, okay, cool. But like, they're also very not into helping the poor. And this other party might allow for this thing that you disagree with, but they are very big on the poor, which is a very Christian principle that we should care about, right? So it's like, if I try and use the party to define, we're not going to get anywhere. I personally, on a very personal level, I I tend towards being libertarian. Um, I'm just saying, get out of it. Like, and just let people do what they do and just govern only what you need to um, and don't overstep because I actually think, I think government oversteps to be honest with all of these issues um, and they're also moralizing. Like I think it's turning into, I think when people spurned religion, politics became religion and now they're treating it dogmatically and I'm like, I, we're not going to align with perfectly with um, any of them. I know that there's a trend among Christians to want to align with a certain party. I don't think that's wrong. I had a professor, I, I studied at a Catholic university. Um, he expressed it so well. He said, a secular nation includes religious voices. And I was like, that is so well articulated. Wow. Yeah, yeah I'm like, that's mm-hmm. that's on point. Um, and so then like, I think I'm more opposed to a religious person being afraid to vote religiously. Like, where I'm just like, why? If, we're, if the claim of democracy is saying your vo- your, every vote is equal, Right, that democracy, and in, in, at least as it's practiced here, allows you to vote because you think your tree spoke to you. <laughs> right? Then why are you ashamed to vote based on a on a belief? Like I think I'm more I'm more cautious of that. And it's funny to see history change. Like at one point, the Democratic Party in the states was considered the Catholic Party, right? And the Republican was seen as the Protestant Party. Nancy Pelosi is a practicing Catholic. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, like, today, it's like, I don't think anybody would associate the Democratic Party, per se, with religion. And and they, most people might not like the religious affiliation of the Republicans, right? Like, just socially, yeah. right? Of just being, like, most people aren't comfortable from either side, from the religious side and the non-religious side. Um, and so, in my mind, I'm like, what is the role of government? I think it worked well to have that kind of discussion when it wasn't so pluralistic. When, when it was a, an actual Christian nation... It was easy, right? Like having the debate about abortion, for example, when everybody is predominantly an actual Christian, whether Protestant or Catholic, right? Like in the West, is an easier conversation to have, right? But once you have a million different religions and non-religions, I'm like, I think we need to revisit, like as, as a nation, I don't even as a Christian, I mean, like as, as, a, as a citizen of the country, what is the role of governance? Um, on those issues. That's something I tend towards the libertarian side of being, I think you shouldn't have any, 
right? Like marry whoever you want, right. just don't drag anybody into it, like mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Well, no, I, I totally agree. Like I, I find oftentimes when like people ask me, it's like, oh, what are you gonna do about this issue? What are you gonna... It's like you're already presupposing that they're supposed to. And actually, if we if we go back towards like the original design of like our government or something, it was never even Canada or or the states or many other countries. It was never meant to handle the things that it's handling today. Um, and so it's kind of it's you know by way of analogy, it's like you know it's like you made a boat. A boat's you know supposed to <laughs> float on water, but then now it's like you added wheels to it, and now it's supposed to be on land, and now you added you know jet so now it can fly like you keep adding all these things to it but it's like mm. it just it's just a, it's a mess it's a complete mess because it's like it originally it was actually it was pretty bare right the, the, <laughs> it was pretty uh limited to what the government was supposed to handle but then as time went on it's like they got involved in so many different areas and now it's like it's presumed in a lot of political discussions Listen, that we're you're only so, gonna yeah. take income tax for this war <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and it's um because it's it's interesting to relate like the the drama between church and state throughout history and i know like different like popes have written encyclicals on it and like obviously christendom's dead that's <laughs> that's pretty clear like we don't live in a like well by christian like not christianity christianity itself is not dead but christendom is in i the... actually have my next question follows on this a little oh, bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a western distaste for theocracy because we imagine it it's going to be like the handmaid's tale a complete nightmare for women i guess or um the fear of religious fundamentalism being in charge and we kind of look at um at least in the western world we tend to look at some place like iran with a lot of fear and we see what like the ayatollah khomeini is doing over there friend of the show <laughs> and women's rights in particular does a perfect world order have to come under a church did mention that you know it's not the state's position the state and church should not be you know the same thing i've also heard the opposite the vatican is a country the church and i don't know if this is the case of the orthodox i feel like it's probably the same the church sucks at temporal administration just terrible at it. Uh, the church's main concern is with the eternal salvation of souls, right? Its perspective is, is usually different. Like, how does this affect our mission to save souls? And the temporal side of things, it's usually, you know, kind of concerned with the common good of the people, or at least it's supposed to be. Um, and sometimes those things overlap. And that's when things get, like, pretty complicated. But generally speaking, like, uh, you know, pr- prior to the Vatican, they had the papal states. The papal states were terribly managed. There's like it's it's an administrative nightmare, and the church was just never very good at handling the things that most governments do, right? It's just it was probably too much, and you know maybe like the principle of subsidiarity not really being applied correctly, um, and so in some sense the separation of church and state can be considered good. In other ways, it wasn't good because you know there's a there's a thought that there has to be a sort of overseer because again like when we come to the issue of abortion the church does does weigh in on that issue because it's like well this actually is affecting our mission right there isn't at that point there is an overlap I, I, again i don't know what uh, how how it is for the for the orthodox but i i, I take it it's maybe probably similar <laughs> i think I, I just come back to you can't divorce those issues from history right like, so like I, I don't see it as um how are we supposed to do it in the sense of like, okay, the religion of the empire was paganism. And then it became Christianity. Like, like these things didn't happen out of nowhere, right? So if that was the thing, and then suddenly your your empire, including religion, is attacked, people are going to react, rightly or wrongly. So I'm not even talking about whether they reacted rightly. Right? I'm just saying that, of course, there's going to be a reaction. The West went a certain route because they maintained power. And then even the new powers that be were still religious powers. And that's something I think... This whole narrative of, of separation of church and state being brought up as a secular issue was originally a religious issue. Yeah. Right? Like it wasn't it we wasn't don't want about the to be in non-religion. Exactly. It was yeah. a Catholic versus Protestant thing of how do we govern in the same place with different denominations. It was not godlessness, and I don't mean that in a in a sarcastic demeaning way, of, of gen- genuinely of like we don't do religion versus religion. That's like that's a new issue. Um and so I'm like, I think so it's not weird to me. So, for example, like when people are mad today of like, okay, if a Christian nation went to war and they happen to be Christians, regardless whether they're ready or not to go to go to war, to be like, oh, they went to war in the name of Christ. I'm like, that might be a misnomer. 
right? They're a nation that went to war and they happen to be a Christian nation. So they might have dragged Christ into it. I love the right? atheist argument about the um, crusades. Every time they bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Where well, I'm just like, okay, but bro, like like everyone is fighting in the name of their ideology at the time. <laughs> like, so like that wasn't new, <laughs> right? Are. Yeah. So it's like, like and that's why even today, I'm like, I would argue that it is a theocracy right now, just not a Christian one. Um, where it's like, if you don't think this, if you if you conduct yourself, like, like they're bringing morality into the law. So I'm like, right. you're, you're doing it. Telling the rest of us to be quiet. Sure. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's reactive. It's, like it's just, I think we're losing the objectivity because it's a reaction to reaction to reaction to reaction all throughout history. Um, and that's something like, to even assess Iran. I'm like, what right does it have a Western to fear that? Right. In the mm-hmm. sense of saying they are a country where allegedly their citizens all believe in the same thing and so they govern themselves right that's when like it drives like so for example not to get hyper political but it, it does get to me is yeah the, the north america went to war in the name of democracy i was saying we need to go into this country because we need to make them democratic right i'm like y- you you have historically believed and still do apparently that you have a right to go in and say this form of governance is wrong Right, like on, on what basis, right? So that's I'm just yeah. like I'm disturbed religiously because I believe that Islam is mistaken on some level. I don't mean to be uh, intentionally offensive, but I, there's a reason I'm not a Muslim. I I believe that what doesn't mean it's keeping back to truth. I believe that this religion is true, right? So if I have a concern about Iran, it it should be rooted in believing that they're actually wrong, right? Whereas if I don't actually have any real belief in a right or wrong then forgive me, as as really messed up as it's going to sound to say it, it's just a difference in opinion if there's no actual right and wrong, right? And mm-hmm. they have formed a community of people of the opinion that that's allowed, right? And if they don't, they'll either have to destroy it religiously among themselves or through the people overthrowing the government. And, and th- that's happened historically both, right? Yeah. Um, and so I mean, it's like, it's, it's like comparing apples to oranges of being like, it's like it's it's a wrong narrative to talk about this Christianity versus the people, right? Like even when you talk about again, not all over the map. Oh, look at how the church reacted to science in its time, and I'm like, that's also how science reacted to science in its time. <laughs> yeah, right. Like everyone did, right? The idea of there being microbes was seen as ludicrous by everyone, including the scientific community, right? So it's like it wasn't a religion versus science. The way it's presented today, right? But the whole country was Christian, so of course the church was involved, maybe more involved than it ought to have been. And then that becomes a lesson in history of saying, okay, watch it, right? Like, so I use that today of being like, I'm very cautious to be, this is what we believe about this. How you want to conduct yourself is completely up to you. But as opposed to being like, you can't, being like, no, you can, you can do whatever you want. We're assessing whether you ought to or not. I guess it's just reframing the narrative in that I think is missing. Very interesting to hear, you know, a member of the clergy actually have a more laissez-faire take on it. Mm-hmm. And then we'll just stick to the principles. We'll let everyone kind of figure it out. So on the topic, though, of the politics, and I think a lot of it stems from one particular moment in the gospel where you have, I believe it was the Pharisees trying to catch Jesus in a, you know, knot. And they, they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes? And he turns to them and he says that infamous line give what is Caesar's unto Caesar's, give what is God's to God's, you know, whose face is on this coin. What do we owe Caesar? Does, is there a, I guess, is there a theological precept, any kind of moral imperative that binds us to our state? We owe gospel to everyone. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the only thing that I would use the language of owing. Because even the context of that question, the reason why they was trapping him was, the Jews saw themselves as a religious nation that was overtaken and that was being occupied by the Romans. And they thought religiously that the, that the, that the Jewish empire, if you will, ought to be reestablished, Jewish kingdom. So to, so to them, they, they, that group religiously believed a proper restoration of Judaism is to be a kingdom. And so if I'm giving money to a Roman, I'm participating in active work against the kingdom. Right. And so that's why I think what Christ was pulling out from under their feet was actually not this this concept of like, just give Caesar what he wants, which was mind blowing. But it was saying, you have it wrong. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's it's, it's, not, about it's the not about that. Yeah. Um, and so it's just saying like nations will do nations, people will do people. And so Christianity happens in a context, uh, humanity. So that's something what we owe is is the gospel. Um, and so that's when like and to that effect it would be like whatever doesn't conflict with with what we believe to be absolute truth, no problem, don't fight. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, for example, at one point in California, when I was living there, they were talking about mandating that priests divulge confessions if it included sexual abuse or or violence. And I was like, I don't care. I'm not doing that. Like, I don't I don't I don't owe you that. Right. So if you mm-hmm. want to tell me how to drive, what I right. can say, right. what, all that. Sure. No problem. But where it conflicts. Is different. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, actually, Bishop Barry made a video on that because they, yeah, they tried to amend that, and particularly, it was particularly with the the sa- the seal of confession, right? And it's just ironic to me because it's like this actually doesn't do anything to help the victims that they're purporting that it's going to. Did it pass? I don't know. Yeah, it didn't pass because uh, it was a pretty explicit direct attack on 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 religious liberty there. So, but yeah, it's like basically, you know, uh, the, the the case in Korea is actually quite interesting. They, uh, the I think it was the emperors or basically the powers that be at the time in Korea, um, you know, way back, they were basically investigating the different religions and they chose the Catholic one because for them mm. it made the most sense. And then Korea was like a Catholic country for a period of time. And then when the emperor's like, hey, the Catholics, the Korean Catholics were saying that Jesus is Lord. But then the emperor's like, hold on. I'm like basically sort of a Caesar thing, right? It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm the Lord, right? And so as soon as there was a conflict, that's when it's like he was trying to, uh, the, the emperor at the time was basically saying, okay, now, now I don't like this religion anymore, right? Because it's conflicting with my power and them seeing me as being the, the ultimate authority. And so the reason they liked Catholicism was because it was big on obedience. But then as soon as that obedience was like, I owe my obedience is first to God. And as long as what you're commanding me does not conflict with his commandments, then I'm, we're good. But as soon as it does, then it's like, I can't, I can't, I have to. And that's basically where you get the martyrs, right? They suffer um, it, because yeah, their, their obedience is first to God. They're, they're like, I can't, I can't in good conscience, you know, do this. Um, yeah. It's funny because we talked mm-hmm. about this earlier. Out of, all power structures feared Christianity because it used the same exact terms that they used for their political powers. You're telling Herod that a new king is going to be born. He's going to go, I'm the king. Stop that. And you get the same thing in Japan when they're persecuting the Christians. It's like, no, no, no. The shogun said it's Zen. Stop with this. Um, you get the same thing in Rome where they're going, he's like, this is going to upset Saturn. And even the Pharisees, we joked a little bit, is like, the younger Pharisee believes this is against the rule. The older Pharisees bring him aside. like, listen, our entire power structure is built on the fact <laughs> mm. that the Messiah is coming. And the worst thing he can actually do is to show up. <laughs> 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 so what I, 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 I always imagine that whenever I'm sitting in one of the Q&As with either you or one of the other priests, and we're, they're getting the same questions all the time. I'm curious what are the most repetitive or boring ones? Because I always hear things like, gay rights, weed, abortion, feminism, and they're all very politically charged, um, but they always seem like they're the surface level of the deeper value questions. What are the most boring questions that you get asked or the most repetitive ones? Are, are they boring to you to hear these things? or Sometimes. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble for saying something, but I asked that question. When it's motivated by just the debate, that's when I'm just checked out. Right. Where it's just like you're not listening. You're here to tell me why you wish I'd be on board with what you're thinking instead of asking what do we think? Because it might even be wrong in your assumption of what we think um, and why. So I'm like, so in some context, those charged issues are aggravating. Um, And in other situations, the exact same questions are exciting. Right. Like when it's just like, but because to me, I'm like, it's getting underneath it to being like, once you understand the claims everything becomes in order and it becomes very much simpler, not necessarily easy, but simple. I think it's for me that when we don't get there, right, to that conversation about what is it, like what is the substance of what we're saying, and instead we're just having it like... They just want your hot take. Yeah, it's like coming in and being like, I heard that this guy screamed at his son and his son came to me and said like, my dad is a jerk and he just yelled at me, kicked me out because I did this. 
and then some heated other person being like, wow, that happened. This and is then, why I don't, I don't watch the news. Yeah, this is exactly, exactly. why I totally And agree. then it goes straight into that guy's head. Like, you're a jerk. What kind of dad are you? How dare you? Like, if you were a good father, you would never kick out your son. And then he's like, he's been stealing from me. And actually, he almost burnt the house down. And then he like, there's suddenly this extra part of the story of being like, I didn't randomly just come at this. Yeah. And maybe I'm mistaken in how I spoke to my son. But it's not for the reason you like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you never get there. So when it's just that surface of like, rawr, right, it's just like, OK, what are we doing here? Whereas if it was instead being like, so I heard you kicked at your son and that really troubled me. Like what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. Then suddenly I might have a great time. Right. Of being like, oh, man. Right. And it might even lead to new questions being like, so is there a time where it's OK to kick out your son? Like, and it might bring up yeah. a brand new, really good question or right? being or do you owe it to your son to always allow him in the house? Right. Like, what is a son? What is a father? Like, it was like getting back to that. But we're I guess the issue to me is we've presumed we all know and agree on all of those principles to then just come at each other for a debate about the practice. So those are the questions where I tend to be like, it's funny because maybe at the beginning of my priesthood, I was, I was excited by those. Yeah. Right. Of being like, yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> like, let me tell you. Right. Whereas now I'm like, if there's multiple priests on the q and I go for it. <laughs> I'm like, have fun. I'm like, when you're done, go for it. I always like the idea that no take should be the new hot take. It's, like, it's not, what is your stance on Ukraine? It's like, what is Russia? Yeah. I prefer that. I prefer yeah. that. I don't know anything. 100%. Yeah, actually, that is one of the aggravating ones. What is the church stance on, right? Like, what is the church stance on BLM? I'm like, we don't have a stance on BLM. We have a stance on how we treat humans with dignity, right? Because if BLM has its own creed, I have nothing to say about its creed, right? So, like, we might disagree with the movement on certain things, right? So, for example, like, I w- I found out, I don't know if they've removed it, but I saw it with my own eyes that it, one of their mission statements was we have a goal of disrupting the traditional family unit, right? So I'm just like, we have a stance on family, right? Like our stance is not on BLM's version of family. They can believe whatever they want, right? But if like those, what is the stance of, or on George Floyd, right? I'm like, we don't have a stance on George Floyd, but we definitely have a stance on injustice in all its forms, even towards any human being, including somebody who's a convicted criminal, we care about, right? Like, but like when it's just like, no, 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 tell me, this so that i can put my facebook insta post um and like yeah. you said i just stopped i checked out i don't read um, like. <laughs> okay so a, a bit of a pivot but you did mention earlier on the the nerd dumb the love of things like lord of the rings is that the biggest popular fiction title for you or like what are other things that you might be interested in or i'm a diehard potter fan nice um but so i Scared some guy at the airport during COVID because of what I look like. Um, but he had a big fat book and I like big fat books. So I'm just like, what is that? <laughs> um, and it was called the um, King Killer uh, um, Chronicles. And I don't know if the author has by now finished the third book. It's been 12 years in the coming. But I ended up really, really liking it. I think you would too, actually, some of the stuff we talked about before. Awesome. When you're using that terminology that one time when we were talking, I was only aware of that terminology because of that book. Um, Did, what was the terminology? You um, when you were talking, I'm drawing blanks right now. You were talking about um, what things meant in terms of wielding "quote unquote" magic about forces. Oh yeah, all of yeah. those things. I'm like, that was all built into it in such a easy way to get. I'm like, oh, this is very cool. Um, so I really, really love that. But I'm like all over the place. I like true crime books too. Like I, I read a lot of. Um, like crime books, like Harry cool. Bosch. Like I've read almost all of them by now, um, <laughs> or listen, I do Audible. But yeah, so I'm between those two right now, and then I fluctuate, and then I get religious for a bit, and then I come back. What's <laughs> hilarious is that the classic Christian upbringing is you can't watch Lord of the Rings, you can't watch Harry Potter because these things have demonic images in them. As a kid, I was banned from Yu Gi Oh. I wasn't allowed to play Yu Gi Oh. I still don't care about it, but, you know, it's just, it's weird. I don't like, know what it is. It's, it's one of those card <laughs> games. It's like Pokemon. Uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of those, you know, Japanese things that caught on and everybody loved it. And I wasn't allowed to do it because mm. dad saw it on TV. It's like, Afrit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's the devil. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you're not allowed to. And then I come back much, much later on and I finally watch these things. I was like, what? 
Mm-hmm. These are Christian values. What are we missing out on here? Yeah. I mean, Lord of the Rings is intentionally Christian. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it's that, again, like the, the issue... This is like I really think the West had it lucky. They didn't have to struggle with this culture versus religion thing because if like culturally this looks so different, what is it? If I can't, if I don't know what it is and I can't trust it, mm-hmm. I'd rather ban it um, to pre- prevent the possibility that I corrupt my kid. Um, but in the meantime, especially for us as the kids, right? Then it, I think it instilled rebellion in a lot of us eventually, right? To just right. be like. Why is this banned? What's wrong with it? And then all those historical sentiments that we've been talking about for the last bit happen on a microcosm. Right? Like, see, yet again, in the name of religion, I'm not allowed to watch TV, right? Like, so yeah. I hate religion. Um, <laughs> and like, it's it all just happens. No like rock that. and roll. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, or D&D. Right. <laughs> that was actually uh, one of my questions. You played D&D with us. Yeah. I DM'd. And it was myself, you, Jared, was with us. And so was Chance, who I'm hoping to bring on the show at some point. Um, what did you think of the whole thing? That was sick. Really? Um, yeah, it was funny because I had no idea what it was. Like, again, growing up, like, I'm like a decade-ish after, like, like my conscious childhood after the satanic panic. So I remember the affiliation of D&D with Satanism right off the bat. So when I had read about it, like recently like before you even asked me i'm just like wait a minute um i was like this actually kind of sounds like fun um and so i actually thought it was i thought it was really really fun i can see how it could be abused but like i mean almost anything can be abused right, right. um but it, it wasn't I, I i thought it was actually really really fun <laughs> <laughs> like i wanted to play again it was a ton um, of fun yeah. yeah no i was gonna try to get it like once and for all from a religious authority, is it witchcraft? <laughs> <laughs> when we played, it was definitely not. Yeah. Right. Like I'm like, if somebody manipulates it, but then it would be, a, it would be a ma- manipulation, taking something that wasn't intrinsically right. messed up and made it yeah. intrinsically messed up. Right. So I'm like, that might exist. And I'm just not aware, but I, I don't see yeah, anything really like the, wrong. This is like the Puritanism, right? Where Puritans they kind of confuse mm. things in of themselves as being evil, as opposed to actions and intentions. Yeah, right. So, like the fact that something exists is not evil, because mm. the, the reason it exists is because of God. It cannot exist. It it receives its being from God, mm. right? And so it cannot, therefore, in of itself, be evil. Be it's the actions and the intentions that actually make it evil. And so the Puritans never understood that, which is why they literally labeled things in of themselves as evil, mm. right? Like, uh, you know, alcohol in of itself, as is, it's evil. It's like, hold on, it's the intentions behind it. It's the, how you use it. That's what may, that's what it, it will become evil if you abuse it, right? Um, but again, it's the actions and the intentions, and that's and that was a lot. Like the Puritans, they 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 came from you know the UK into yeah. into America, and that Puritanism hasn't really died. It's still still alive and well. And yeah, and it's taking yeah. on weird forms. Uh, you mentioned Harry Potter earlier. Yeah. And I was, it's really funny how in the absence of people like getting the Bible stories, Harry Potter's become a new morality basis for them. Yeah. yeah even to the point where like they, they will treat Donald Trump like he's Voldemort or something. <laughs> for instance, um, there's many, uh, you know, using the term muggle to refer to somebody who's, I guess, not LGBTQ. I've heard that before. That was really funny. I didn't hear that. Um, yeah, but they have like all sorts of versions of that. Mm-hmm. Or like even this characterization of the Slytherin type of person. It's like, well, yeah, that's a corporatist. <laughs> in a version, yeah. We imagine the people who run Google are Slytherin. I, I, every test I've ever done has pointed me as Slytherin. So <laughs> <laughs> take an affront to that. I think you were trying to become Slytherin. That's my guess. <laughs> it's the coolest one. When I look at something like Marvel, and AD and I talked about this on a podcast right before. Um, the idea that where Marvel comics have always been, in some sense, trying to reestablish a pantheon, that yeah. we look at the way that Iron Man, the Thor, and all these people react, it's like, these are like the stories of Hercules and his trials, right? They have morals and themes and all this stuff embedded into it. It's not yeah. necessarily as, you know, as, as much of a Genesis story that like establishes orders of the world like the greek myths did but they do interact in the same way that a pantheon does and i'm curious is like marvel has exploded you know since before being bought by disney you know all this stuff um and it's being treated on such a massive scale what do you think of marvel 
or like these, you know, wider cinematic universes or whatever it is, you know, that people are using yeah. it. I think something's going on, like, because so, I I got into I got into Marvel late and I liked it. Like, like, like what I was watching was entertaining. Like, it was fun. There just seems to be a concerted movement in media today to go back to these gods and to paganism specifically, um, where like I'm a little bit confused by its intention. I'm like, is it to reduce the traditional religions that are now pushed out to being like, here's another mythology among mythologies. Um, is it m more than that? And the reason what made me draw a question was actually not Marvel. It was so like my generation, Sabrina, the teenage witch was this cute, funny TV show. Yeah. Right. Like, and that was it. And then I saw a couple of episodes of the, the re the Netflix made thing one. and I, it was n not just so dark. It was like, take out your name from the book of life, like blot it out actually and write it in the book of the devil and then undo your baptism, like renounce your, like they're using Christian terminology so explicitly and they say that, right? Like it wasn't like I read into it, like, and I, right. that's how I took it. It was like, no, no, you, you, you said that. It's not um, like the fun uh, Sam Raimi evil dead kind of yeah, Satanism. It's actual it's Satanism. Dark. Yeah. So I was just kind of like, that's something like I have one eyebrow raised right now at Marvel where I'm like, I don't understand it yet. Like, I don't know what this is. Like, I, I haven't seen the new Doctor Strange one, but I heard a lot of people have a very viscerally strongly negative reaction to what seemed to be a push in a particular just direction. Um, so I was just kind of like, what's going on here? Um, or again, like you're saying, when people use things religiously, like when X-Men, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm ignorant, like, and I'll profess it, of what was the original author's intent for X-Men. But like when it got sold as, and maybe it wasn't just being sold, maybe it was the reality that it's meant to be LGBT, LGBTQ plus versus civilization and that we don't recognize the beauty of their mutation um, as this narrative. If that was meant, okay, interesting. Like then, then you've been faithful to what it is. I mean, but if it wasn't, then, then what's your objective? Jack yeah. Kirby, Stan Lee, they made that stuff way before. Um, any All of the that. LGBTQ story. And it was mm -hmm. really to them, I guess, in a sense of like, hey, we're the scrawny Jewish kids being picked on because we're weird mm. in that way. And I think, you know, that spirit stayed in it so long that I think a lot of people like, oh, okay, we can graft our ideology onto it and use the same kind of underdog theme, even if yeah. we aren't the underdog, right? And that's the issue, right? Like to, like to tie a lot of what we talked about today together is that in spite of my own personal reactions to things, I'm cognizant that a lot of messed up things happened in a religious world. I don't want to use the word, word because of religion, um, because mm -hmm. I don't know that that's a fair assessment, actually, and as long as I'm afraid to say it, exactly. Yeah. As much as it being like, okay, people are reacting. So I can imagine even with some of the things that I'm saying, that something like, well, serves you right. Now you know what it's like to be the underdog and to be the minority and a majority that doesn't think like you. And to that, I'd say, yeah, there, there is merit to that. Yeah. And like that might've been a privilege that we didn't recognize. I think as a cop, we're not used to that. So that was never our narrative. Like, um, but in the West, maybe that's why it's coming. I still think it's messed up and wrong. Like, I don't think the solution to what you perceive as a wrong is to keep doing it to a new victim. Um, where it's like, if you really believe what you were saying about those models, then fix it. Um, but because I do think that there is an underdog aspect to this, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, naturally, because if somebody's the underdog, we always look at them like they're the good guy anyway. Right. No matter what it is that they're actually the underdog for. Yeah. I'm on to my last slew of questions before I dive into them. AD, did you have any questions for Father AP? <laughs> Didn't actually this is uh, i had i had one this is it's a very philosophical question but it's actually one that i anytime uh someone's kind of read in philosophy theology i'd like to ask right which is it's i'll say the technical question and then i'll maybe explain it a bit more for the audience in terms of what i'm actually asking sure do you believe that the will precedes the intellect or that the intellect precedes the will in other words in layman's terms is what we believe based on what we want or is what we want based on what we know. So it's, it's like, this was a huge conversation between Plato and Aristotle, right? Because they disagreed on this. Um, although not as much as some people think, but basically, because for Aristotle and St. Thomas kind of following Aristotle, he believed that the intellect was kind of the higher power. So knowledge is kind of king, 
in many ways, right? And which is why education is so important. But then Duns Scotus, who was a Franciscan at the time, was more on the will side, right? Because he was thinking more like God is like God's will and things like that. And so the emphasis had to be more on on kind of on on taming the will, let's say. Um, and so you can see how the scholastics with the Thomistic kind of more tradition, they're very big on education. And I see that a lot with Catholics. And that, this was actually a thing where I, I started to see this kind of the Catholics being very big on like education, on knowledge and all this stuff and coming up with all these crazy technical terms and just books and books and books and books. Whereas the East, I found them, <laughs> they're kind of more like I've compared like a Catholic priest. When I mean a Catholic priest, they're more like a doctor or like a professor. I, I literally just used yeah. this in one of my questions. Oh, yeah. It was him who said it, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or they're like wizards, right? They, they, they have a more mystical, uh, I find kind of vibe to them or like Gandalf or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if it's connected to the fact that they are, I don't know, maybe because you're listen they're to the not the beginning as... of this podcast and you're going to laugh to yourself because I just literally said oh, that. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. It deserves to be said twice. But in, in terms of like the focus is not so much on like, I guess, or it's not as much on, on what you know. Um, but I, I, does that make sense? Am I asking it right? Is yeah, it... I don't know if I'm qualified to answer, but... My gut reaction is actually most of us are very pro the mind. Like the Orthodox are hardcore about the news, mm-hmm. right? Like that the seed of everything is is the, the spiritual eye, right? The image and likeness. So I I see the, the merit of both, which is not a cop-out question. I favor the intellect mm-hmm. um, in the sense of because it's in the image and likeness of God. It is what governs. The problem is that because my, and I think this is why there's a debate, because that I, to like for lack of a better word, or that that mind can be polluted, I can see why there'd be those who'd argue, all right, since your mind might be polluted, then at least function properly. Because if you wait for your mind to be clean to function properly, you might never. Right. Um, so like I can see like just again on a very basic level because I'm I'm not very intelligent. Of uh, being like I can see why that that debate emerged. Whereas to me it'd be like. Like St. Paul says, renew your mind constantly, right. like in accordance right. with Christ, and then, right. and then the actions will follow. Yeah. And yet, I would also subscribe. And if you believe this is true, but that the belief is true has the mind part in it, right. then just do it, right. right? Like regardless of what you're feeling or what you know about it at one point. But I think that's why the underlying issue is faith. And faith here, I don't mean the social meaning of that word of like blind faith um i mean it just in, in as simply as the word trust mm-hmm. i was saying to build trust involves my mind mm-hmm. um and if i have enough trust mm-hmm. i'm not as concerned about my mind right where it's just like if i like i'll, I'll use my bishop as an example like in california because i adore him i knew him late in my life Right. So if we had a conversation with him and he'd be like, hey, I want you to do this and I'm allowed to have a conversation with him. Right. Then it'd be like, OK, but like, you know, like I I, I have this consideration. I'm a little bit worried about this. And I don't know if um, you've taken into consideration this or this or this or this. Like I'd have those conversations and he'd, he'd entertain them yeah. as I got to know him better and him me better. I didn't need to say all that. Right. Like it would reach a point like if he said no to request before I'd be like, I- I'm going to listen. But like you do know, right, like I, the mind would get active. But when I saw and got to know him better, being like he likes to say yes. A. Then B is just like not just he likes to say yes. He even knows my personality where he's like, oh, you would do so well here. Right. Or situations where I'd find like oh, he's been doing this, anticipating what problems might arise to protect me, right? right? Then it's like suddenly I have this trust that's being built, mm-hmm. right? Like, and that's why I'm like, it's knowledge and experience, both, mm-hmm. right? Where I'm just like, now if he's like, pack up and go, I'm not interested in asking why anymore, right? right? Where I'm just like, I know that he cares. I know that he loves me. I know that he knows me. I know that he likes me to be happy. So whatever, right? Like, yeah. like that, that became a product. Yeah. Yeah, because like this, that this distinction, right, mm-hmm. between intellect and will, and which one's the more powerful, and which one, like, who's who's running the show? Is it the is it the will or is it the mind? Mm-hmm. Right? Who's who's really calling the shots? And you know, I would say like it can it can alter, 
Um, but it's interesting because like when the, you know, because when the new world was discovered and you have all these people who've never heard of the gospel, yeah. this was a really big question because um, it, it, it affects the way that we evangelize, mm. right? And so like, for example, I remember talking to, I'm not sure if you ever met Father Michael at Holy, uh, it was a nativity. It was a Antiochian Orthodox Church oh, in Langley. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I talked with him and he was really good, but he, it's interesting because the, the way he described the, the Orthodox style of evangelization was very different than, than the Western one, which is basically, they typically set up a monastery, someplace that doesn't really have one. And the monks just pray for 30 years and then people slowly start coming over. Right. And it's, it's a completely, it's like, wait, but they don't know. They don't know. You know, it's all this, like yeah. you have to tell them you have to, it's like kind of like you have to give them the car, the pamphlets. Not that those things in of themselves are bad or anything, but it, it's just a, it's a very different emphasis. Right. And I think that's why a lot of times, like, even as I, like, as I kind of mature in the faith, grace becomes a much more tangible reality to me Mm -hmm. where i realize like until god's grace moves your will i feel like i'm just throwing a rock at a wall and it's just gonna bounce off and nothing's really gonna be absorbed and so it's like the will even like the will to open up the mind and actually receive what you're saying is huge right and so it's it's i i feel like it's probably a both and situation right where it's not like yeah versus but sometimes i'm like it I think, at least in the West, I think it's certainly the the position would be like the intellect, obviously, right? The Mm. mind, right? That's why we're so big on education. That's why we're so like, and propaganda would seem to, to to emphasize the fact that if you can really, if you can, if you can influence someone's intellect, you can basically get access to their will, right? Because if I can really get you to believe something, then it's like your will is just going to, you know, it's going to follow suit, but... Anyways, that's uh. That it's, was it's funny the I've been reading the I mentioned it a million times probably not on this podcast but the Corpus Hermeticum this old uh, book of Hermetic tradition characterizes God as being the original will. So in that sense, I guess their answer to the question might be that will came first because God willed to be and then willed the world to be and then of that the things that were being began to know. So it starts with will. In that sense. But it, it does kind of seem like in our day-to-day lives like a chicken or egg question in that way. But yeah. we come back to it. You know, it's that, it yeah. almost feels like we've been talking about the same dichotomy before. The thinking, feeling, objective, subjective, spiritual, secular, will, intellect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on that notion, I, I was talking to a group of Sunday school kids, young kids, trying to explain to them what the word secular means. And then obviously I had to use the word spiritual as its opposite to help define it. Um and I was, it's like you have one foot in the spiritual world, right? Your mind is up there on God, Spirit, Holy Spirit. You got the other foot in the earthly world. We're here in the material world. Um, and I was trying to explain to them, I was like, look, everybody wants, so that's the cat. Do you want to open the door for the cat? Sure, sure. <laughs> Hi, Mishmish. Yeah, okay. Now you're not alone. You feel happy now? So I was trying to explain to them, that it's interesting that in the mind of the secular person, they see it as separate as there is a spiritual world and a secular world. But in the mind of someone who is spiritual, we don't see a difference. We see it as like everything is the same matter. It is both spiritual and secular. And I was trying to explain to the kids in some ways, like if you are secular without being spiritual, you can end up being sad. But if you are only spiritual without keeping a mind on what is secular, you will end up being silly in a lot of ways. Because there's a way to let your you know head kind of drift off into space, just thinking all the time, without having any basis in reality. Man, he's being loud today, that cat. But in the end, I, I'm wondering if this is true, if you think this is true as well. Is there a difference between the spiritual and secular world? No. Mish, mish. Like, in the sense that they're united. And that's why I'm just like, that's why I think the theology matters. Like, what's our claim? Right? Because our claim is that there's this unity of body, soul, and spirit. That th- that they're real entities, if you will, that you can't functionally erase. Right? Like, in the same way where it's just like, I usually always use the example of being like, if I am physically hungry, I might get hangry. Right, like, like there's an actual effect, like on mood, which is immaterial, right? As a result of this neglect of one component of self, right? And also, if I have 
a malnourishment spiritually, whether like in, in the realm of the material, like, or let's say actually use a positive example. When I'm in a great mood, I have a physical tolerance of more, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like that's a real human experience, right? So it's just like, that's when like this, this dualism is unhealthy because it's always pitting them as competing ventures as opposed to I think the Christian standpoint of saying both are holy when used rightly and so then it becomes a matter of how do I bring this back into order as opposed to how do I get rid of one or elevate one right like because of a proper human is is body and spirit like that's that's why it's called the human right right? not an animal yeah totally and it's 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 a it's a struggle even for like Christians to to, <laughs> to yeah. keep those two things together, and I find like it's um it's so fascinating how like you know the life of the church is basically always trying to walk trying to maintain that mean. There's always forces trying to pull things apart, right? Trying to separate things, but the church is basically like no, nope, like they're actually they're, you don't have to do this, right? Yeah. And so it's like that's why it's like the whole thing with like it's basically divorce. All every like untruth is basically it's it's essentially a divorce. Two things which actually they can coexist, but we don't like it because it's it's like there's a mystery. There's something to it, mm-hmm. and there's something about when opposites come together. There's joy, right? And it's like when you think about laughter, it's usually that. It's usually a coming together of opposites, mm. and there's some type of joy. There's some type of create, and that's what creation. Creation is the same thing. Yeah, it's the two sides have to come together. The in two a joke, sides right? have to come it's together. The punchline and premise, right? And so I find that's the the you know. I'm reading a book right now on discerning spirits, but one of the ways, like the, the evil spirit is always trying to pull things apart, always trying to take and keep them like cold and isolated from one another. Whereas the good spirit is trying to actually unify. It's always a unifying uh, communion spirit. All right. So let me get on to my last few questions here. How do you see the Coptic community growing in North America? When it's, Stops being a club. Hmm. Like, it's okay if it's a club of, of believers, but a club of anything other than that is a no. Right? If, like, if the church sees her mission in preserving culture as opposed to truth, then it's doomed. So, but if, it, if her eyes are on the gospel for everyone and the desire that everyone be in, then it will, it'll be completely, it'll be, it'll be more properly Catholic in the universal sense. That's fascinating. Cause again, we, th- does that mean we'd lose the Coptic? Part Possibly it's something that I'm going to probably get stoned for this, even though I appreciate <laughs> that I'm Coptic is that like, I'm okay with the label Coptic to say that, my origin is in the church of Alexandria, not the ethnic Egyptian part. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm proud of, uh, as an individual, I'm proud of my Egyptian roots, right? But I'm just saying that the church is not about my Egyptian roots, right? So there's a heritage of being from the church of Alexandria in the same way that there's a heritage in being from the church of Rome. Mm-hmm. Um, and that if I want to be honorific, hey, buddy, um, <laughs> of like, that yeah, part, yeah, that's <laughs> um, cool like like that that's not an issue that's something i have a preference for example it's just personal preference of like i'd rather something be called saint mary orthodox church and underneath it say coptic orthodox patriarchate right to say this is an authentic church it's not some random cult it's not some guy that raises his hands and decides to create a parish right but that it's like no this has a rule a rooted apostolic origin but that the emphasis in the name is not my egyptianness um, like just so I can bring back an order of like the Coptic means I'm, I'm the church of Alexandria. Um, but I think that this struggle here, sorry, the microphone, sorry, I'm the cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the struggle here has been that it is about how do I preserve Egyptianness um, in a lot of parishes. I think other dioceses have done better than others on this. And I think it's just a matter of longevity in a place long enough to, to deal with that. Um, but when it's like, when you go to a place and they want to teach the kids Arabic, right? Not just Coptic, but Arabic. And That's I'm like, strange. why? Um, like, that, that was even a language imposed on you. The reason you wanted is to be able to communicate with them. 
So if your desire was that so that you could be in community How about be- you learn English? better, <laughs> right? Or like, let's say there's a grandma who can't. I'm like, okay, then it's an act of love because we're trying to be community better, but not because the church is supposed to, right? Like it's once you start getting that language, mm-hmm. right? Or for example, I'm like, when the church's mission is not to the locals, right? Where I'm like, it's cool that you send money back to Egypt in the same way that Paul collected money to send to Jerusalem. But what are you doing right here? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, have you gone out to Hastings Street? Like, we have a lot of problems here. Right? Like, like why don't why aren't we helping them? Right? Or in Ontario, like where I originally come from, like, where it's like, how come we're not out like shoveling snow for the seniors um, wish, in the wish. area? Um, where I'm like, like, are we the church of the people? It's kind of like the mission, like what you're saying with the monks. I'm like, actually, that's, I actually think it's beautiful. Yeah. Like, yeah. to be honest, like, I'm like, that's really cool. I didn't know that that was the philosophy. I'm like, that's beautiful. Um, but I mean, a monk is meant to be in on himself, depending on the order. Right. Whereas the church is supposed to be at the feet of all people. Yeah. If we recover that, then the Coptic Church can go somewhere. Oh man, like the history of uh, my uh, my girlfriend, she her favorite course, and she went to a Catholic university. Her favorite course was was monasticism, and the history of monasticism is incredible. Like they fed so many poor people. Like having a monastery is actually one of the biggest blessings in a community, mm-hmm. and like secular people should be able to acknowledge that. Like if you mm-hmm. really study the history of these monasteries, like they do so much for the community. Yeah. Um, and again, like these, there's some of the most virtuous people you'll ever meet, right? Cause their day is basically labor and prayer <laughs> yeah. every day. Well, you know, it was of course that stereotype of, oh, it's the people with the white squares and the nuns with their rulers. They're all going to abuse us. <laughs> well, like, of course there's going to be, yeah. you know, well, it's always trip ups and stuff like that. Yeah. Why do you think you've gotten so popular especially with the younger end of our congregation. I mean, we were talking about this at the beginning. It's a trouble to try to book you for anything. <laughs> I'm anxious to call myself popular. Um, I'm, like, I'm, I'm calling to that. you popular. There's uh, clearly something. <laughs> what is the... What, what are the elements? I have no idea. I, I, I will suppose that it's just... like meeting people on ground zero. Like, I don't think it's... I don't think it's any, and I'm not being false, humble. I don't think there's anything really special about me. Like, I, like, and if there was, I'd be like, okay, then that's from God. But I wonder if it's just like, you know, he wants to leave. Do you want to let him out? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I've had enough. He's like, no, if you're kicking me out, I'm not leaving. He's like, are you coming? He's considering it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's like, what oh game my is God. this? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, so you were saying? I wonder if it's just about being on ground zero, or I think maybe like something that somebody said to me once that I felt good about, and I don't know if that's wrong to say. It's like it's an awkward, it's a good question, but an awkward one for me. Yeah. Um, in the sense of like being comfortable in one's own skin, I think can have an effect. Um, where it's like I think a lot of people associate religious religiosity with pretentiousness, and my best mentors in my life who were also the monks we're not mm. um like so they were the image to me of i can be myself and be a christian i just have to work on what's not right objectively and i think because it's true i think there's an appeal in that of this feeling safe of like wait so i'm allowed to express this opinion right like i'm al- allowed to joke i'm allowed to play i think that there's probably been some yellow or red tape around some of that before that maybe people are more comfortable with or just that i'm young and speak english it could be just that <laughs> um. <laughs> i mean that's that's the one thing that all the older people will say is like he speaks english fluently that is like their favorite thing to mm-hmm. bring up is like you have to listen to this guy <laughs> he knows english that's, um, that's the standard that's the standard and the other part to it of course is like the age thing i think that's a bigger Mm. jump to it it's like the fact that you know lord of the rings and harry potter and this stuff can Uh kind of help part of the way because everybody (laughs) knows it now but i think it's maybe something deeper than that yeah is that ground zero yeah you know meeting them there i I could like just in like i uh, it's only been like what an hour or so like in my limited experience of you (laughs) (laughs) but i could see i think kid because i'm you know i'm doing sunday school now kids are you know like super young or even like young adult are super perceptive 
like unbelievably so. I think actually adults are the ones who their perceptions dulled over time. Like they're kind of, you know, they they're very they're very set in their ways. Let's say right, and so they don't actually always see as much. Uh, whereas kids, like I think, even the slightest alteration in, in in any given like statement or just it's crazy how how much they can tell. They they won't be able to articulate it, but they'll get a feeling. Mm-hmm. They'll get a feeling, and so I think in your case, I think it's. You just come across as being like I think very real, I, right? I and I think that's that's really important for for a young person, right? Is like he believes in what he's saying. Like it's 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 different. Like he's not, and it, I think it's a not that like the older priests aren't doing this as well because you know in the Catholic Church I see this as well. But it's like they just that's his job or something. But if they if it doesn't feel like it's a job or you're like selling something or it's just kind of more, um, I don't know, it just feels kind of. Uh, uh, like you're more of a witness as opposed to like a a commercial like a teacher i think i think kids don't listen to teachers they listen to witnesses um, and maybe that's just true for people in general i think but, it might yeah. be you know i was talking to somebody about this actually earlier saying that it's like it's you don't really when you go to the, one of the older coptic priests that we have you know there's a, definitely the respect there's the understanding that hey this person knows more than me they've been doing this for this many years but when you speak to them you're not sure that you're actually being heard Right, you don't get the impression that you're always being heard, and that's something that's kind of rare to find in any sort of spiritual leader. Which is funny because you'd think that that would be the number one thing in that sense, right? The well, listening is the power. Like a kid's like, oh no, he's trying. Like, <laughs> 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 um, so let me move on here. You're going to be leaving us soon. You're heading back to LA, LA uh, the city of angels. The youth groups that you've been working with for the past while are understandably very upset about this. Um, how do you feel about it? That's a hard one to answer. Because like if I'm not emotional enough, some people will be offended. And if I'm over emotional, they'll accuse me of being pretentious. Um, I think that's that same anxiety. Nobody's really thinking. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I'm hyper like concerned all the time. I'm like, yeah, I'm upset. Um, because and I won't sound it right now because I don't think it's right. real to me yet. Like. Because of how often I get moved as a monastic, it's not new. So it, it's never easy, but it's not as hard. Like like the first time it happened to me, I think I was like, I, I was sobbing for like an hour at communion, and I'm like, I'm leaving, which might happen next week, but probably will happen. But I'm sad about it Sorry. for sure. Sorry, I'm sad about it for sure. The part of me that's not because I don't want to make it all misery is like. I mean, I left another place to be here. You know, what, you know what I mean. Like, it's it's not the first time. So, like, I think the hard part for me is that because I actually love people, like that I meet. Like, I don't just mean that in terms of of like emotionally. I mean, like, I I, I get actually a- attached and really care. Um, so I'm always concerned about people. I'm like, okay, how are they dealing with this? Where are they at right now? Like, in my mind, I'm following up even if I'm not by text because I'm notoriously bad at that. But like of, of that concern. So I think I struggle with that a lot. Or I think some of the humility has to come in with being like, you're not their savior. Like, like they were just fine when you weren't here. They're going to be just fine when, when they leave because like God cares about them. But I still struggle with it. Like, so I am definitely sad about it i have no idea for certain yet where i'm being sent next because i think i'm going to be reassigned as well so there's been all sorts of rumors and for all we know next week they're like actually just joking stay um like so <laughs> it's like that's I, the nature I imagine of it. it's that wheel from the book of mormon they're gonna swing it and they're gonna be like uganda <laughs> um over your time here what is one thing a that you like about Vancouver and one thing you don't like? Church-wise or the city? Both. Um, I'll go to the city first. The people, like Vancouver proper, not Langley, Surrey, like not the Tri-Cities, Port Moody, like Vancouver, like they're cold. Um, like <laughs> like in Ontario, like we've always had this rep that Vancouver is, is America. Um, I see why. Um, <laughs> like I think there's validity to that. The splendor. Like, I'm sure everybody says that, but, like, even the license plate is all spot on. Like, it is beautiful British Columbia. Like, yeah. it's epically gorgeous. I'm like, this has some Lord of the Ring feels. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's just epic. That does something to a person. Like, I'm just like, everywhere you look is so beautiful. In terms of the 
the youth like as the primary responsibility i think like just the sincerity and kindness of so many people like it's it's that I, and it doesn't sound mind blowing but almost the me, opposite of vancouverites yeah like <laughs> like it's funny cuz like within that context on a personal level i'm like everyone's been so awesome um like on a personal level am- among the youth in particular like as the people that i was here for um of being like that like ground zero is enjoyable right like it wasn't like oh no like i have to go with people i'm just like i wonder if they're sick of me um like i'm like cuz i'm having a blast right like yeah. do you want to do this do you want to do this i think the constructive criticism is the lack of process or lack of system um which is not in the hands of the youth to begin with but i'm like that i think is probably was my biggest struggle in vancouver because i came from a place that was the complete opposite it was extremely gifted in that department so everything else naturally pales in comparison and but it was it was all i knew ecclesiastically right so like it was just like i'm used to a very clear straightforward very predictable process so there's no surprise um you know who to talk to about what what will get done how it will be like there's no it's not hard mm-hmm. um here's like there's a million arrows pointing in a million different directions and I'm like, I don't know which route to take. Um, so I'm just going to hide under a rock um, until someone just calls the shot. I mean, it's funny that you say that because I've definitely noticed there's been like a lot of in and out people, you know, and it's someone who's been there. I'm someone who's been there the whole time and even I'm like no responsibility <laughs> the whole way yeah. through. So it's like I can definitely yeah. see that. But it looks like it's actually on a much better route now. People taking charge and all that. Okay. Oh my god, dude, we've been like here for Rogan levels of time. It's been, we started talking at like 7.15. It is now 10.30. That's quite, the, that's no quite the penance. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, when, if people want to find out more about the stuff that you do, you have a website. Yes, I do. Um, I'm so awkward. Give us that sweet URL. It's um, truthandfreedom.co. I just don't have my name on it pretty much anywhere. Um, but wherever I'm next, that's also where I'll be like communicating schedule um, and stuff. If I end up back in California and not reassigned, then I'm actually probably going to still do the one-on-ones long distance. So even that would be open for anybody who wants to just call and chat um, through there. Just random Forest Creek listeners. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Forgot this in Sunday school. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Don't hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have books and like audio stuff on there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people want to find out more. Yeah. For us, it's Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, LinkedIn, <laughs> Vimeo, and maybe even Rumble. I can't remember if I made a thing there. But uh, and more places soon. Just let us know where you want to see us. We're all there, everywhere at the Forest Creek. Don't forget to like, follow, share, subscribe, and all that. You know how it is. We probably don't need to tell you this. You're adults. Our website is coming very soon. Did you buy that URL yet? Uh, we can talk about that after. I'm going <laughs> to... We want it to be a penultimate place for you to not only find our content, but also to read about our services. We are offering bespoke branded content for your business, your organization, your product, your ministry, or your real estate purposes. We welcome everybody for both content and services to come and find us and come and get in contact with us at theforestcreek at gmail.com. Apologies for the irregular episodes. I've been going pretty hard with the podcast right now, but uh, we've got more content in more dimensions coming very soon. Before we go, AP, can you bless the Forest Creek and or this podcast? I don't know if there's a prayer for that. You put me on this spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do it after. <laughs> God bless. Um, to everyone out there, my name is Raf. My name is AD. I'm AP. God bless. Godspeed. Via con Dios. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next episode.